This is the Ultra Running History Podcast. I'm your host, Davey Crockett. Thanks. Thanks for coming. This is episode 133, the fifth part of the story about Frank Hart, who was the Jackie Robinson of 19th century ultra running. He broke the color barrier and fought racism with his feet and sometimes with his fists. This multi-part series is a slimmed-down version of Hart's Amazing Life. To read the entire history, get my new book on Amazon, Frank Hart, The First Black Ultra Running Star. Search for Frank Hart, H-A-R-T, on Amazon. My third book in the Ultra Running History series is now available on Amazon, Strange Running Tales, When Running Was a Reality Show. I wrote it while trying to recover from total knee replacements on both my knees. <coughs> Stories include fistfights on the track, strange hallucinations experienced while trying to run for six straight days, love scandals, corruption, and bribery that crept into the sport, sickness, death, and even murder. Get Strange Running Tales on Amazon. By 1888, Hart had competed in about 36-day races in nine years. He had reached 100 miles or more in about 40 races and had so far won at least 30 ultras. Perhaps because of his color, he had not been given enough credit as being a dominant champion during his career. There certainly were some who were better six-day pedestrians, but he was at least in the top 10 of his era. Racist labels against blacks such as laziness were often heaped on him, which bothered him terribly. He worked very hard. How could anyone who competed in six-day races be referred to as lazy? He did have a serious problem with his finances and likely had a gambling addiction. He looked for new ways to make money in the sport, including race organizing, and had been criticized for not paying runners fairly. He was so mad at the reaction that he vowed that he was retiring from the sport. Hart's retirement did not last long. He entered the next big international six-day race held on May 7, 1888 in Madison Square Garden. For this race, 96 men entered and 44 started. In this race was George Littlewood of Sheffield, England, the world record holder for walking 531 miles in six days. In this race, after the first day, Hart was already more than 20 miles behind. On the morning of day two, after running 122 miles in seventh place, Hart was said to look lazy and quit the race as he was falling in the standings. He realized that he would not finish in the money. Littlewood went on to win with 611 miles. Throughout 1888, Hart competed in several 75-hour races in New York, Connecticut, Delaware, and Pennsylvania, winning most of them, but earning less than he hoped for. Feeling rejected by Boston, he now claimed to be from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Hart competed in the most historic six-day race in history, held November 26 through December 1, 1888, in Madison Square Garden. There were 100 entries, but they approved only 40 starters. Leading up to the race, Hart trained at the polo grounds in Upper Manhattan each day under the watchful eyes of trainers and admirers, with several other entrants, including Littlewood. It would be the last six-day race held in the original Madison Square Garden the old building would begin to be demolished on August 7, 1889. It was located on the block that currently holds the New York Life Building. Nearly 10,000 people filled the building for the start with 37 contestants. Through the first night, it became obvious why the building needed to be replaced. The ring in the center of the garden looked as if it had been swept by a hurricane. Booths were overturned and the floor was flooded with melted snow which had dropped through the crevices in the roof. It didn't seem to bother Littlewood, who covered 77 miles in the first 12 hours. Hart was about 12 miles behind and struggled early. Several doses of bug juice were taken, 
and the Haitian youth was wobbly in the legs, and his eyes rolled in a fine frenzy for hours. He covered 113 miles on day one in 11th place. Again, racist comments were made by reporters that he was being lazy, but later he received compliments. Hart, the colored man, seemed to grow more graceful in his movements as the others stiffened in their limbs. He reached 204 miles after 48 hours and had moved up to ninth place. Ten men reached 200 miles during the first two days, which had never been accomplished before in one race. By the beginning of day three, only 18 of the 37 starters were still in the race. Littlewood seemed to be the greatest eater among them. During the morning, he ate 11 lamb chops, washing them down with two large bowls of oatmeal gruel. Hart reached 283 miles after day three. He confined himself to a fast walk instead of trying to run or do a dog trot. Littlewood took the lead during the early morning of day four, close to world record pace. At 7 a.m. on day six, with 563 miles, Littlewood caught up to the world record pace. The contingent of British subjects, which had infested the garden since the race began, cheered and the sleepers in the back seats awakened and joined in the applause while the band played Rule Britannica. Hart was about 80 miles behind, but still worked hard to get in the money. On the final day, Hart passed 500 miles at 10 a.m., Littlewood passed 600 miles at 3 p.m. He went on to break the world record with 623 miles. As with typical six-day races of the era, they were actually scheduled for 142 hours, two hours less than the six days, so the crowds could get home before Sunday. Littlewood stopped at 8.07 p.m. and later came out for one more mile at 9.27 p.m. At 10 p.m., they presented him to the crowd as the champion of the world, and then he made a victory lap wearing the diamond belt. Hart finished in sixth place with 539 miles, running a smart race. He won $463 for his week's effort. Ten men exceeded 500 miles. Hart had now witnessed the six-day world record broken for the sixth time. They all thought that it would soon be broken again, but it would stand for 96 years until Yanis Kouras broke it in 1984 with 635 miles. On February 6, 1889, Hart left for California on the Cincinnati Express with other runners to take part in a six-day race there. They arrived in San Francisco a week later greeted by a crowd of fans eager to catch glimpses of them. Frank Hall put on a six-day race in Mechanics Pavilion. He hired many people to serve as ushers, bartenders, and scorers. Contestants needed to reach 525 miles to get a share of the gate receipts. Hart Badmouth, the former world record holder, James Albert of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, who chose not to travel to California to compete in the race. He said, Jim Albert is a coward. He could not run in the company that is in the city now, and so he wanted a sure thing of getting a thousand dollars from Frank Hall before he came here. Because he did not get it, he raises a fuss and tries to injure the race. The race began on Thursday, February 21st, 1889 at 10 p.m. in Mechanics Pavilion. California six-day races typically did not have a problem racing across Sundays. So great was the jam of a great crowd gathered at the entrance that the managers decided to throw open the door two hours ahead of the advertised time. Then there was a frantic rush for the seats of vantage. 12,000 people were on hand for the start of the 28 runners. The pace was torrid. The bands in the gallery and on the main floor had not finished their first piece before the second mile was reached by the front runners, including Hart. As usual, there were complaints about the scoring early on. 
Hart and others threatened to quit the race if they didn't score the runners correctly. Hart reached 100 miles in 17 hours 40 minutes and then took the lead in the race. He completed 131 miles in 24 hours, which was a Pacific Coast record. The colored waiters collected in a body and danced a breakdown and using their platters for tambourines. Hart reached a very impressive 221 miles after 48 hours. The world record at the time was 257 miles held by Charles Rowell. On the second night, Hart looked tired and dozed as he walked. From time to time, he roused himself, rubbed his eyes and the back of his head, and hastened his speed with springing steps. At the end of day three, Hart reached 297 miles and was behind Thomas Howarth by three miles. Band members amused themselves by putting facial decorations such as whiskers on sleeping spectators and then using their instruments to rouse their victims with great laughter. A wad of blazing paper in close proximity to a sleeper's legs and a yell of fire proved a favorite method until officials put a stop to it with threats of arrest for arson. Then they resorted to pouring ice-cold soda on the sleepers. When Hart dogged Howarth's pace, things got testy. Finally, when Howarth was on the verge of madness, he turned on his tormentor and hotly accused him of trying to spike him. Hart replied with equal warmth, and the two fought with their jaws for half a dozen laps. They were about to come to blows at one time, but interference prevented a slogging match, and the cloud of war blew over. Because of all his dogging, Hart was given the title of The Bloodhound on the Sawdust Path. Hart was very demanding with his trainer Frank Edwards. He once demanded Malaga grapes and declared he would not run another mile without grapes. California was able to supply a bunch or two, even at such an unreasonable season, and after eating half a dozen of a bunch, the cranky tramp imagined that he was in fine spirits and spurted for four or five miles at a seven-an-hour clip, eating fried egg sandwiches as he traveled. He finished day four with 359 miles, just one mile behind more. On day five, Hart had a sore knee and it was bandaged. He reached 436 miles, still within striking distance for the win. Hart took the lead on the final day. The firm track was taking its toll on him. His trainer said, The tan bark has been very hard. It was not fine enough, and there was too much on the track. There was no spring to it, no give to it. As a consequence, it used up the man's feet in a horrible way. We had to put our man's foot in a mold of plaster of Paris and used everything we could think of to reduce the swelling. There was a lot of doubt whether Hart or anyone would reach the 525 miles required for prize money. He reached 500 miles with six and a half hours to go. Hart went on to win in a very close race in front of 13,000 people. The most demonstrative applauders were the representatives of the colored population who were present in force to cheer their champion in his victory. With 15 minutes to go, Moore reached 525 miles and quit. Hart, only six laps ahead, also stopped. His win earned him a huge payoff of $3,720. It made his California trip worth it if he could just not squander the money away. The next day, he was asked how he felt. He said, I'm as hungry as a bear. I have been a professional pedestrian for 12 years, and I never suffered so much in my feet and limbs as I did during the match just finished. The track was a poor one. The heat from it caused all walkers' feet to be parboiled. When asked about his plans, he said, I intend to stay right where I am. California is good enough for me. I am going to open a sports saloon in this city. Californians have treated me well so far, and I think they will in the future. He quickly opened a saloon on Morton Street, which he called The Strand. The street was known as the sleaziest street in town, 
later renamed to Maiden Lane. With the financial success of the February race, another one was quickly scheduled for May 1889. Hart and others trained every morning in downtown San Francisco on an outdoor track. Later in the day, a few of them would take a run through Golden Gate Park to Ocean Beach and back again, finishing the day's work by another two-hour spin on the track. In this way, the different peds do from 30 to 50 miles a day. There was continued bad blood between Hart and James Albert, who decided to come west to race. Albert had said some nasty things about Hart to the press, and Hart vowed to beat him in the upcoming race soundly. Hart would have to eat his words at this next race. Albert reached 142 miles in the first 24 hours, and won convincingly with 533 miles. Hart quit on the third day with 203 miles, quote, foot sore, sick, and disheartened. The San Francisco Chronicle quickly turned against Hart and wrote, Frank Hart is disgusted with the race. He came here expecting to be the winner. Champion Albert's appearance at the onset frightened Hart, and becoming weak-hearted, he pulled out of the contest. There probably was truth to that, because the night after Hart quit, he ran a 10-mile sideshow race with no problems. There were only a few hundred spectators at Albert's finish. California was quickly losing interest in the six-day races. Hart's perceived California six-day gold mine was drying up. After participating in some more minor races on the West Coast, earning no significant money, Hart gave up on California. In December 1889, he headed for Cleveland, Ohio, where he did poorly in a six-day race. He stated plans again to head to Australia, a claim that he had been making for years. In April 1890, he stated at a six-day race in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, that it would be his last appearance on an American track. He intends to locate in Australia and has already one or two good pedestrian engagements booked for there. But as the race began, Hart complained about his feet. He said if he didn't place in the money, he would cancel his Australian tour, apparently needing the money to get there. He quit after the first day with only 77 miles. His Australian plans were off. He continued to race in the eastern states, but would often quit early if it looked like he would not win any money, or if the crowds were small. His motivation to compete was only to win money. Hart competed in a six-day, 12 hours per day race in January 1891 at Minneapolis, Minnesota, and was very popular there. Hart was the center of interest for all the colored people present, of which there were a great number. With sore feet and a swollen knee, again out of the money, he quit after 48 hours. But he liked the attention received and decided to make Minneapolis his home for several years. He was still referred to in the press as the colored boy, even though he was 35 years old. They did say he looked much younger than his age, but it was a typical racist label for the era. In March 1891, the first six-day race was held in the new Madison Square Garden, too, located on the same block as the old one that was demolished. It had been open for nearly a year. Opened on June 16, 1890, the second garden filled the entire block from 26th to 27th Streets and from Madison to what was then 4th Avenue, where the Gold Crown New York Life Building now stands. An outer track, 10 laps to a mile, was constructed for the runners along with an inner track to be used by other athletic attractions. The race was highly competitive, with 36 starters. After the first day, Hart, about 30 miles behind the leader, reached 100 miles and quit the race. John Hughes went on to win with 555 miles. The next month, Hart made a rare return to Boston for a six-day, 72-hour race. It was observed, Frank Hart, the veteran colored pedestrian, did not seem to be in the best condition and acted rather tired. He was out on the first day. 
He estimated he had career earnings and wager winnings totaling one hundred thousand dollars during his twelve-year career, valued at three point two million dollars today, and that he had hardly anything to show for it. He said that the money went out just as fast as it came in. The four valuable belts that he won during the height of his running career had all been won away from him. Something that saddened him greatly. In 1891, Hart, still with a home base in Minnesota, took on a wager for a 1,000-mile race against Henry Messier of Milwaukee, an experienced six-day runner, for a $1,000 wager. The race would be for 10 hours per day, and estimated that it would go for 23 days. The only available building in St. Paul was in the basement of a drugstore. They constructed a tiny track. Twenty-seven laps to a mile. The first man to reach one thousand miles would be the winner. Hart was very confident and said he would wager all the money he had that he would cover the distance at least three hours ahead of Messier. The race was a huge bust, lost by Hart. After two hundred forty-four miles and six days, about twenty-one miles behind Messier, Hart quit, claiming that his feet were so sore that he could not continue. He lost a bundle of money. At the end of 1891, Hart cared more about his legacy. He embellished stories for the press. He claimed that he used to be a steel engraver that worked in the National Steel Engraving Bureau during President Ulysses S. Grant's first administration. He also stated that he had been in more six-day go-as-you-please races, thirty, than any other man living. Nobody at the time kept track. George Norimac, Samuel Day, and probably a few others had more. He also claimed that he broke the six-day world record twice, but he only did it once. Hart finally had some contact with his family. He learned that his son Frank S. Hart, age fourteen, had taken part in running races. This was true. Later in 1894, a mention was made in the Boston Globe that Frank Jr. won a two-mile foot race. That was part of a massive picnic of 2,500 quote colored people held at Highland Lake Grove, south of Boston. The article confirmed that he was the son of the walker. In 1892, at the age of 35, Hart seemed to change his racing strategy. Instead of going out hard to win at all costs, he had a more patient attitude. At a six-day race in Kansas City, it was written, Frank Hart, the colored champion, glides along steadily at an easy dog trot. He says it is not his style of race exactly, but he will be around in the vicinity of the leaders at the finish. But his old attitude came back when he dropped out at 132 miles because he saw no chance to win. Observers felt that Hart was going downhill as a runner. And he indeed had a string of six-day races where he quit early. It was speculated. These long walks not only bring physical wreck, but frequently permanent mental disorder. It had been more than a year since he had finished a six-day race all the way to the end. In most of those races, he could later find the strength to earn twenty-five dollars by racing in a sideshow ten-miler, while the rest of the six-day runners continued plodding along. Quitting early was his new reputation. In April 1892, Hart finally finished a six-day, 12 hours per day, heel-toe walking race to the end in his adopted hometown of Minneapolis. During the race, he did a little trash talking and said that Willard Hoagland of Auburn, New York, was not as fast as people had been saying he was. This bugged Hoagland, and he had the last lap. Winning the race with 315 miles, five miles ahead of Hart. A rumor circulated that Hart had gone insane after the race finished, but the next day he was seen on the streets, laughed, and said, "Well, I haven't reached that stage yet." When pedestrians were offended by another, they typically would issue a challenge for a duel, not with pistols, but with their feet. Hoagland issued a challenge to Hart. For a 10-mile heel-toe walking race, and would give Hart a half-mile head start. 
both deposited $100 each into a bank to accept the duel. As with most of these duels, it never took place. After five months away from racing, Hart appeared at a five-day race in Chicago, Illinois on October 18, 1892 at the Battery D Armory with 18 starters on a small track 16 laps to a mile. Hart, aged 38, was not washed up yet. He reached 128 miles on the first day and 199 miles in 48 hours. He came away with his first win in over two years, reaching 479 miles. But the race was a failure among the spectators. By mid-race, only 200 people watched at any one time. A month later, in November 1892, he took part in a six-day, four-hours-per-day race in Racine, Wisconsin. An alarming report was issued. Hart went to pieces on the track last evening, and his career as a pedestrian is no doubt closed. He was taking with hemorrhage of the lungs. After only 62 miles, he was vomiting up large clots of blood in front of hundreds of people. He was able to board a train for Chicago to get treatment. Newspapers across the country were reporting that, quote, he will never be seen on the track again. Rumors spread that he was near death in a Chicago hospital. But then his friends reported he was going to race the following month in St. Louis, Missouri. Was it finally the end for Frank Hart? Stay tuned to the final episode about his life and running career. With that, this is Davy Crockett, and this is the Ultra Running History Podcast. I hope you run fast and far, enjoy life, get outdoors, and most of all, stay safe and don't take unnecessary chances. <laughs>